16% of triangles are acute. Why? Hi, I'm Scott Baldridge, professor of mathematics at Louisiana State University. We're here at the Sci State Studios with Clayton Schankweiler, who is a professor at Colorado State University. Today he's going to talk to us about the shapes of triangles and their relationship to polymer science. Clayton, can you tell us a little bit about the answer to the question you posed? Sure. So the question is a little bit of a weird question, but you could answer it fairly easily if you knew, like, what's the collection of all possible triangles? So you try to make a shape out of all the possible triangles. And then you just identify the acute ones and see how big they are compared to the whole thing. You get a percentage. Yeah, exactly. So show us how you do that. Okay, so the, the problem is how do you encode a triangle as, you know, a point in some other space? So let's say we have a triangle. Let's say has sides A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And then if we're interested in, well, how, what's the percentage of acute triangles, it doesn't really matter how big this triangle is. It's the same, it's same acute triangle if it's this big or that big. Exactly. So all we really care about are the ratios of the three side lengths, A to B to C. And well, mathematics has a lot of tools to think about ratios. And it's, it's a really well-studied phenomenon. And it turns out that you can encode ratios of three numbers as points on the sphere. And what would then, so you're, what you're saying is that for every single triangle that you have corresponds to some point on the sphere. Mm -hmm. So if I have this point over here, maybe it's a weird shaped triangle, but I have a point over here, maybe it's a right triangle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this case, what, uh, show us what the, the picture would look like for acute triangles. Yeah, so if you're looking for what are the acute triangles, well, if you can find sort of the right triangles, then you're going to see, well, the acute is going to be sort of on one side and the obtuse ones are going to be on the other. So the right triangles, well, I'm, I'm really only drawing an eighth of the picture. So you see this picture, and it's really repeated seven more times sort of in the different octants of the sphere. Mm -hmm. And so, but these curves correspond to the right triangles. So every point on this curve represents a right triangle. Exactly, so. yeah. And, and then you would have, uh, so where are the acute ones? So the acute ones, it turns out, are inside of this funny looking shape. And so then you can just find, well, what's the area of, of that funny looking shape? And it's about 16% of the area of the whole sphere. This is really clever. So how, how do you, how do you take a, a problem like this, and, and, and which is hard enough, mm -hmm. how, how do you uh, take a problem like this and generalize it? Well, so I actually got interested in this problem because I was thinking about, um, so if you think about a triangle, you can think of it as kind of you have a shape where you take a step in some direction, and then another step in some direction, mm -hmm. and then you come back to the starting point. But that's three what steps. What mathematicians call a walk. Right? Yeah, so this is called a random walk, an example of a random walk. But you could have, you know, maybe you took, you know, a bunch of steps, maybe you even intersect yourself, and you come back, and eventually you come back to your starting point. So like a generalized polygon in some sense. Yeah, so this is like a generalized polygon. And then you can ask questions like, well, acute versus obtuse triangles, you re the real question you're asking is what is sort of the shape of a triangle, sort of on average? And so you could ask the same sorts of things here. What's the average shape of one of these things? And I take it that this starts to get really interesting as the number of sides of the, of the generalized polygon go up. So if yeah. you've got like a thousand sides? Yeah, you could have a thousand sides or ten thousand sides or a million sides and you can imagine, you know, so, you know, tons and tons of sides going on. And, and then you want to know, like, what's the diameter of the circle that contains this whole shape or, you know, those, those sorts of things. For, for a given number of sides. Yeah, yeah. So say so you had 573 sides and you want to know, you know, what percentage of these are contained in a little teeny ball of, you know, of radius one versus, you know, what percentage are much bigger than so basically asking questions like this again. Yeah, exactly. But with a much a stranger looking space. Yeah, yeah. 
and, yeah. and in that stranger space. Yeah, so you space. can encode these kinds of things in stranger but still fairly nice spaces, and then you can you're again asking questions about about those spaces and percentages of yeah that have certain properties and so on. Yeah, exactly. So this is related to polymers in some way. Can you tell us a little bit about polymers first, and then and yes. Tell us how that works? Sure. So a, a polymer is just a long stringy molecule made up of what are called monomers. And you have you know, a monomer and then a bond and then a monomer and then a bond. And these things look kind of like this. They're these long stringy things. And so, for example, DNA is a polymer. Um, RNA is a polymer. Proteins are polymers. Um, but also, so those are biomolecules that are polymers. But then also things like uh, rubber is a polymer. Plastic is a polymer. Nylon, you know, polyester, all of these things are so polymers. basically, Everything that we use on a fairly regular basis, including ourselves, yeah. are made up of uh, polymers. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it becomes very interesting in, in, in being able to identify uh, different types of polymers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, explain so so explain to us then how you use the the properties of a polymer to be able to um, to to actually find polymers. Yeah. So so. People like right now are out synthesizing polymers in really interesting shapes because they want to create new polymers that are new, new materials that have like good properties that are particularly bouncy or particularly stretchy or whatever. And the thought is, well, if you could create these polymers with new and interesting shapes, it would have new and interesting properties. So how do you identify the polymers with the shape that you want? Well, you really need to understand like what is the average shape? You know, what percentage ha you know, have this particular shape? And then once you have that, you can, you know, you, in a chemical reaction, unfortunately, you can't always produce 100% of what you want. You get some stuff that isn't what you want. How do you distinguish the stuff you want from the stuff that you don't? Well, you need to kind of sift, you know, your, your soup of polymers into different buckets or different bowls, maybe, since it's soup, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so you, you want the polymers that have the shape that you really want into bowl number one by, you know, identifying, well, we know, like, polymers with these properties have this kind of a shape and then we can measure that using you know scattering experiments or whatever. So same way that we had we were able to identify a certain percentage of, of the triangles uh, are acute, you would be able to say a certain percentage of our soup of polymers is going to be a polymer of this type, right. maybe a polymer of that type. Yep. And that helps us sift these yeah. into the different into the different uh, bowls, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really interesting. Well I thank you so much for, for coming. I, I just have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that you do art. <laughs> Can yeah. you tell, tell, tell our viewers a little bit about the art that you do? Yeah, so I, I got into making art actually through mathematics because I was, I was doing research and I was, I was producing things like this. And then the question is like, well, how do you visualize these complicated mathematical objects? Because if you can see it, often you understand right. it a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so I got into, <laughs> exactly, so, so I got into how do you visualize these things? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I started making things that looked pretty cool. And then I just started going, you know what, I bet there's a, there's a really cool visualization of this mathematical concept. And then I just sort of went from there, like started making animations and, and things that really sort of. So, so if, student, if people go to your website, which mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll provide, um, they'll be able to see some of this over? Absolutely, yeah. Well, Clayton, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. Thanks for watching.